For the past few weeks, uh, we have been studying the benefits that David described in Psalm 23, benefits that people who have the Lord as their shepherd can expect to have. The same shepherd that David described all those years before is the same good shepherd that we have, our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to read Psalm 23 in a moment, but let's read it with this context in mind. Up till now, we've been looking at each benefit each week, and we've only got to verse 3. We're going to verse 4, and verse 4 is a transition. Psalm 23 is a psalm we're all very familiar with, and sometimes when we're very familiar with something, we start to miss some very important things. So I want you to watch out for the transition. There is a change in style of writing that is so important. David was an amazing musician, songwriter, poet. When he makes a transition in style, I assure you it's completely intentional. So see if you can spot it. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you spot it? People are smiling, they're nodding. Well, if you didn't, now you see it, you will never be able to unsee it because it's a distinct transition. David has gone from speaking to his audience or his readers about the Lord in the third person. Now he gets to verse 4 and he turns away from his readers and the audience, even though he knows they are, he's talking to them still, but now he's speaking to the Lord directly. Up till now, the analogy of ordinary sheep has been working really well, hasn't it? But now he's just focusing on the real sheep with a shepherd, that's us humans. Because where he's going now, ordinary sheep cannot go with their shepherds, can they? He is talking about an intense personal relationship with the shepherd. Ordinary sheep don't do that with their shepherd. But the amazing thing is that we can, and David did. He had a personal relationship that he was completely confident of. That's why he could say, you are with me. This is about intimacy. And as we were told last week, quite rightly so, it's not about familiarity. Some people cross over into not fearing God anymore. They cross over into familiarity. That's a very dangerous place to be. But it is certainly about intimacy with God. But what an astounding, it is an astounding statement that a human being can say with confidence that God Almighty, let's think about who we're talking about for a moment, because we tend to forget. 
we tend to forget the fear of God because we forget to think about who we really are talking about. He is the creator of everything. He has all power. He sustains everything. If he takes away his word, everything will crumble into nothingness. The same God, an ordinary human, a child, a boy, a girl, can say, he, my God, is with me. For the rest of our deliberations and reflections on Psalm 23, what comes after this transition all will hinge on this fact. You are with me. So with that in mind, let's read our main text or our focus for this week. Can we all read it together? Psalm 23 verse 4a. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Can you see what the focus is here? Fear. You know the kind of paralyzing fear that cancels faith. The fear that the Bible says, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. We're not talking about the fear of God. And we're not talking about the sensible fear of real danger that the Lord has given us as a gift so that we don't act foolishly. Like think we're fearless, then we jump in front of a moving car and say it's not going to kill us. There was somebody who said to Tim that we are all gods. So Tim said, well, you go, if you want to prove to me that you're a god, stand in front of a moving car and not die when it kills you. So that kind of fear is not the one we're talking about. We're talking about the fear that paralyzes us. So we can't act. We can't think logically. We start doing things that are wrong. We start behaving in ways that are not appropriate for people who can say the Lord is with me. That's the kind of fear we're talking about. So David is talking about fear. And you know, so he's talking about God's protection. Do you agree with me? He's talking about protection. He's talking about, I am protected from all this stuff. So I will not be afraid because God is with me. But what are these dark valleys that he's talking about? In David's real experience, as you can see on the screen, there, are, there were real dark valleys where people sometimes had to, not necessarily a, a comfortable option, but they found that it was the best option for them or they had to, for some reason, pass through these paths that are really paths at the bottom of ravines or gorges. And you can see from that picture that even though the sun is shining elsewhere, in that place is always in the shadow. And it's not just physical shadow. Historically, true that bandits and robbers, people with evil intent, that have given over to influence by the evil beings that try to corrupt humanity and succeed in. These people lurk there because they can trap people there. Predators lurk there as well. And I'm told that sometimes they experience flash floods when it's been re raining somewhere else. So sudden danger arrives. David is talking about this life, isn't he? The, he went for the worst case scenario as well. Did you, have you noticed the Bible does that all the time? We're trying to avoid the worst case scenario, but the Bible goes for the worst case scenario and deals with it. Then you know everything else would be okay. Has David not just done that? He 
knows that he knew that he would be passing through dark valleys in this life. And that is meeting difficulties and challenges of different sorts, things that threaten our well-being, things that make life difficult. But he's talking about the darkest valley, the worst case scenario. So maybe this picture gives us more of a mood that this is a place of danger. This is a place of discomfort, whatever it may be. And the worst case scenario, let's call it physical death, that somebody faces the darkest valley when they are leaving this life. No matter what age you are now, would you not agree with me that this world, that all of us live under the valley of the shadow of death? There are people who, would, who woke up this morning not knowing that they're going to die before the day's over. We live in the darkest valley because there's always the threat of death. If it's not from evil people, and there's loads of them, people who do not obey God's laws, and instead they allow themselves to be influenced by the evil one, so they visit evil of different shapes or descriptions on other people, well, those things affect everybody. Everybody lives in the shadow of death. That. If it's not people with evil intent, it could be just the world that is groaning because of man's rebellion against our creator God. We have famines and diseases and earthquakes and sinkholes and hurricanes and tsunamis and landslides. Should I go on? Fires. There's such a constant threat to life. Would you agree with me? We are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And in that worst case scenario, it is the darkest valley. And David knew that, but he says he will not be afraid. Where does his confidence come from? The point is not whether he will pass through the valley or not. It is whether he's going to give in to fear or not. Where did he get his confidence? Can I say to you that that's where we need to go this week? Because we don't just claim it. We have to have a reason. The faith we have is not illogical. It is the most logical faith you can think of. You just have to have the right premises to base your logic on. It's a reasonable faith. You don't suspend your brain in order to have faith. So that's where we must go. Why was he confident like that? Can we be confident like that too? So we can be assured of God's protection and know that we have it. So that when we face difficulties in this life, we're not afraid. We face life every day with courage. Where did it come from? May I say to you, that all of it hinges on this. God's covenants. That's where it comes from. God's covenants. Now, explaining covenants, maybe we need to start with something that is not quite there, like contracts. Contracts are not covenants, certainly not God's covenants. But we kind of understand contracts, don't we? Somebody has something you want or need. The other person has something to offer in exchange. So they agree. And when they sign a bit of paper or whatever else they do, they have a binding agreement, don't they? That can stand up, say, in the court of law that this exchange happened and it must be followed through. That's contracts. is between sort of equals. But it might help us to step up into the idea of God's covenants. 
Because God's covenant is not equal at all, isn't it? God is doing all the work. God initiates the covenants. Now think about it this way. What's God's problem with humanity? Or what is humanity's problem? Is disobedience. It is quite simply that. That's what sin is. If somebody is doing something contrary to the will of God, they are in disobedience, they are sinning. It's as simple as that. So God, I mean, his grace in choosing to reach down to us, God could have decided to give up on the whole of humanity. And he would be right to do so. Everybody deserves banishment from God's presence. Because everybody has sinned. Everybody has disobeyed God. That's what the Bible declares. And it's true. We know it. But God, in his grace, didn't give up. So how did, does he connect with humans? Check the Bible. It's through his covenants. He initiates them with individuals, with groups of people. He does all the work. He will sustain it. He will keep all the promises. We've been reading it in the Psalms today. He makes the promises and he fulfills them. He totally fulfills his promises. There is no question about God having the power, the love, the steadfastness to complete his side of the covenants he initiated. The only thing that the humans need to do is to meet his terms. You just meet his terms and you can relax because you have the assurance that God will do his. That all uncertainty vanishes if you focus on meeting the terms of God's covenants. You see, some people misunderstand grace. They think that grace means you can disobey God and still be covered by his covenant. That is not grace. Grace is the fact that you're done for. I'm done for. But God, through his covenants, has done all the work. He's going to do all the work. And he's reached down to me just so I can respond to him in obedience. If you disobey him, you break it. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to follow God. That is the point of Jesus' coming. We can't say Jesus came so that we can continue in sin. He came just to destroy the power of sin and disobedience. But the grace and wonder of it all is that God didn't give up on you and me and that he reached down with his covenants. And so he made a covenant. Think about it with Noah. Go and read about that. It's hinged on obedience of Noah. God did everything else, didn't he? What about Abraham? He had a special covenant with Abraham, but Abraham had to obey God to meet the terms of his covenant, of God's covenant. And then we go on to David. David had a personal covenant with the Lord in addition to the old covenant. Did you know that? God said to David, if you obey me, your offspring will always be on the throne forever. And which offspring of David is going to fulfill that? Jesus Christ. See? But in his day-to-day -day life, David fulfilled the terms of the old covenant. The old covenant was the covenant that God gave in order to take a people, a whole nation to himself. The whole nation, God invited them them to be covered by this powerful covenant. Go and read about it. Then God go, told them, these are the things I'm going to do for you, the blessings of obedience. And these are the curses or the, or the, the consequences if you break the terms of the covenant by disobeying me. Read about it. I'm not making it up. So David... We know, not by making it up or imagining it or extrapolating it, we know from his story that David, from when he was a boy, 
lived to meet the terms of God's covenants. No matter how young you are here today, you too can commit yourself to meeting the terms of God's covenant. And for the rest of your life, you can be assured of all the blessings in this life and in the next. It's the only way to have that assurance. It's not by signing a bit of paper. It's not by saying a prayer. Although prayer can express what you're saying. Do you see what I mean? Well, don't say because I said a bit of prayer, then I'm in. I can do whatever I like now. I'm now in. No, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. There is nowhere in the Bible that that is taught as true if you take everything in context. So we are invited, or the whole nation of Israel was, and David did. But they didn't all meet the terms of the old covenant, did they? Let's just take one example. The battle with the Philistines, with Goliath threatening Israel. Do you remember that battle? The king, who was supposed to have read the terms of the old covenant and lived by it, the king was quaking with fear because one giant was threatening the whole army of God's people. The rest of the soldiers were quaking in fear for days. Why were they afraid? You can go back to read about their lives. None of those lived personally according to the terms of the old covenant. Take Saul. Go and read the story of Saul. Did he follow through? He didn't. No wonder he was quaking with fear. His confidence failed. Well, they could boast before that battle. We are the people of God. But when it came to it, when it came to the crunch, They were quaking with fear because they did not follow through on the terms of the old covenant until a boy showed up, a young man, who did. You can see from his own testimony that he knew God was with him. He knew God was protecting him. Why? Because he committed his life from a young age to live according to the terms of the covenant. That was where his confidence came from. Not that he was sort of guessing. No, he knew. And so what did he do? He said, keep your protection away from me. Don't give me heavy armor and things like that. I'm going in the name of the Lord. And did God not protect him? Not only did God protect him, God gave him an amazing victory. And then the others benefited from the victory of a boy who was committed to meeting the terms of the old covenant. And so he had full confidence that God would do his part. What about us? Do you realize that the covenant we now have is better, much, much better than the covenant that David lived under? The new covenants ratified by no less than the blood of Jesus Christ himself. His death, his resurrection, his ascension. This new covenant is superior to every other covenant. It supersedes every other covenant. There's not going to be another one after this. This is it, and it's open to all humanity. But we have to meet the terms of the new covenant, and what are they? I'm sure people will tell me here because that's what the gospel really is. Repentance. Asking for forgiveness because of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. We receive forgiveness and salvation. Ongoing salvation, the hope of future glorification, all of them ratified by the precious blood of Jesus. Let's read what Jesus himself said and look for the term that I've just described, the crucial term of the 
relationship, what must happen for us to be confident of all the benefits that God gives us in Jesus. John 14, 15 to 18, the very first statement there says, if you love me, keep my commands. And, you see that, consequently, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because he neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Do you know David would not have been able to say that? Well, we can say additionally to what David said, you are with me and in me. Wow. We're, do you know who we're talking about? Let's remind ourselves. We're talking about the same God who created the whole universe. If you want to have courage and confidence in the face of all the problems in this world, meet the terms of the new covenant. And you can be completely sure without a shadow of doubt, that's real faith, that God is more than able to do his bit. We have testimonies, don't we? We heard one this morning. Amazingly, I wanted to just talk about briefly that there are people here who have experienced incredible deliverances, but the deliverance from car accident is quite dramatic, isn't it? Where they're driving, obeying the law, then some lawbreaker comes and plows into them. Suddenly they're facing death, the darkest valley, if we like. And they walked away without a scratch. Have we thought about that and given glory to God for all the, there are many people, there are people, there are, I can call at least two people here to give such a testimony. And we heard one already this morning, if you were in time. Praise God. That's what we're talking about. He delivers us even from what we're not aware of. Now, I too have faced physical death a number of times. The ones I was aware of, you know, there are some that God delivers us from. We don't even know that he has just delivered us from death. But there are some we know about. The ones I know about, wow, I have experienced incredible miracles. But I want to tell you just one especially because of the young people here, I picked one that happened in my younger days. You see that? That tells a lot about what I was studying. A Bunsen burner. I'll tell you about that. Now, my final BSc project many, many years ago, we won't talk about that, I had to work with a very dangerous chemical had to work in very safe conditions. I won't give you the details, but what you need to know, what helps you to understand God's deliverance, is that it was like a complicated glass setup that is airtight. So I was using a Bunsen burner to t turn gas, sorry, liquid into gas, and then that gas has to turn back to liquid. Otherwise, pressure would be building up in the airtight glass vessel. Due to an unwitting mistake, I didn't complete the process, simple process that will make sure that the gas was being changed to liquid. And I just sat there, you know, just in front of this dangerous bomb that I was building. It was a bomb because the pressure was building up. And then suddenly, my Bunsen burner went off. And I said, oh no, now I've got to do all this all over again. What happened to the gas supply? But my lab partner who was working on a similar experiment on the other side said, no, there's nothing wrong with the gas supply. My Bunsen burner is still on. And then we looked closely at what was going on and we were both shaken. 
we realized what had happened. If that Bunsen burner had not gone off, we were about to be killed instantly from a major explosion in the land. That is God's deliverance. If you want to praise God and... I would have died there, then. Both of us, actually. Now, this girl, this is the good thing. That, you know, God uses even these things to bless people. The girl whom I'd been trying to be a witness to and telling him her how much she needed the Lord, God, kept pushing back and saying, you know what? Because of this, because of that, I can't even be sure that God exists. Do you know the only statement that came out of her mouth when we sat down shaking, she said, this is God. And it became so easy to tell her about salvation. Praise God for that. But the point is, when I look at all these deliverances, the ones I know of, I know that the day I die, so long as I keep meeting the terms of the new covenant, is the day God wants me home. So I will not be afraid of death. Do you see what I'm talking about? Fear goes away. Courage comes. No matter what we face, we know God is with us. But somebody might say, well, what about the Christians who have died, who are dying for their faith now? What about Christians who served God wholeheartedly? In the Bible, remember, John the Baptist was beheaded. If you check, he wouldn't have been more, it, he was just a bit older than Jesus, physical age we're talking about. He died young, he was beheaded, and he served God wholeheartedly. What about James the apostle? He was beheaded. And then Peter, shortly after, was saved and protected. Those questions are important. You remember when I told you we have a reasonable faith? Some people say, oh, don't talk, don't think like that. Just claim it and, you know, just, no. No, we need to face questions like that. Otherwise, they will just hide somewhere and be eating away at our confidence in the Lord. We need to face them. Parents, you need to answer the questions. If you don't know the answer, go and do your research. Ask questions. So we can answer the difficult questions that our children ask us. We, it's our responsibility to do that and to keep growing, all of us. We don't know everything. So hold what you think you know lightly so that when God reveals the truth to you, you can throw away rubbish and believe the truth when it can be proved that it's biblical. So that is where we need to go. We need to answer those questions. I want to maybe begin to suggest an answer to the one I've just asked before it starts to cause trouble in our hearts. Let's read Colossians 3, 2 to 4. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It doesn't all end here, does it? We're heading for glory. That's the first thing to remember. That if we are called to suffer to that point, it's okay. So long as we're not suffering because we've wandered away from God's protection, from the terms of the new covenant. This is how I like to think about it. You see that in Christ person, inside that wall of protection and care and the promises of God, that's me there. I'm in Christ. You want to be able to put yourself there as well. So long as we meet the terms of the new covenant, covenant we are in Christ. And we are fully protected in Christ. 
But we must remember that above all that is God's purpose. And God is working out his purpose throughout. And so sometimes in God's purpose, we are called on to suffer. Because we live in an evil world, rebellious world. Did you see how God delivered me from death? And then my friend became easy to lead to the Lord. God's purposes trump everything. So we are in Christ, we can live with confidence. That's the norm. And if we're there, then we find that we're passing through some difficulty, persecution, trouble, like our brothers and sisters are doing all over the world and staying faithful and fearless because they know they are suffering according to God's purpose. And if you read Romans 8 in this context, you will realize that our sufferings in the sense are achieving for us a future glory that far surpasses it all. Hence, somebody like Paul, who was fearless, was able to say, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's a win-win situation, brothers and sisters. I hope that begins to address that, so we don't let that compromise our confidence that God is protecting us. He's protecting his own. He has the power to. He is willing to. And he will continue to do so. Now I want to finish. But I want to tell you one more testimony. Because of the young people again. It is that faith by proxy. What I mean is piggyback faith. In other words, I have faith because of somebody else. Because of I'm riding on somebody else's faith, no matter how famous or wonderful the person is, it doesn't work. Not even the faith of our parents will work for us. Well, I thought he could. Here's my testimony. When I was about between 10 years and approaching 13 years, we were embroiled in a brutal civil war. And... It was, I won't tell you too much more about that. You know what? Civil wars are the worst kind. But my father was a godly man who served God for most of his, all of his life really, wholeheartedly. He was now an elderly man and he was, he had some significant health challenges, including the loss of his sight. But because of his influence at that time, we who were still at home didn't ex experience the deprivations of war. We had plenty of food, more than enough to share with people around us. And we never were behind enemy lines and we never actually saw fighting or war because every time the sound of war came close and people came and moved us with my dad. But there was something nobody could protect us from, the air raids. Do you know... If you put, type something into a search engine, you'll be amazed what you can find. I think that this bomber here was one of the very ones that terrorized us all those years ago. Yes? Then there were the fighters. Well, they were terrifying because they would come screaming past in pairs, it seems. So the noise was, will kill you first. But the other thing was that it was not, the, they didn't come to support the war front or the military. They were killing anything that moved. They bombed markets. They, these fighter jets were no, sometimes they would follow cars on a motorway and kill everybody. So you were always, we were all literally living under the shadow of death. You could die at any moment. But you know what? My father, because of his health challenges, never moved. Everybody else would be running helter-skelter. He just sat in one place and prayed. And my faith was totally dependent on the fact that I knew that because my father was a godly man, God was not going to allow him to be killed. And I was totally, I had complete faith in that. So no matter what's going on, I would just sit beside my father 
and hear him pray. And you know what I didn't like so much was that he prayed for those killing and those who are being killed, for God to have mercy on all. And we actually, at a point, we said to him, why are you doing that? Why don't you use your special audience with God and pray that all our enemies will die? It made sense to us at that time. Do you know, my father would just listen. Okay, let us pray. And then he would start praying for our own souls. That God will have mercy on us who want to kill people that Jesus died for. Anyway, so anyway, any, any time I was with my father, I felt safe until I was not. I was caught out. The fear would have taken my life. I was petrified when these fighters came by. I thought I was already dead. Well, can you see what I'm saying? That was faith by proxy. Would it not have been so much better if I had faith in the almighty God, not in my father's faith? I benefited from my father's faith, like some believers do. They stay with other believers who have faith, and they get some blessings. But you need to get faith of your own. And I'm talking to you young people too. So speak to your leaders. You know them. Speak to your parents. You want your own faith. But also, we who think we're okay, let's examine ourselves to make sure that our faith is really faith in God, and that we are meeting the terms of the new covenant. Then we can all say, let's read that again together as we finish. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Well, thank you for listening, and may God bless you all. Let us pray. Yes.